Hello, and Hello. welcome to another episode of David's Divergent Discussions. I am your host, David Gray Hammond, and today I am joined by Kelly Booker. So, um, today we're going to talk about sobriety and being neurodivergent. Um, you probably know if you followed me that I have been on my own sobriety journey for the last seven years, and I'm excited to have Kelly here to talk more about her experiences with uh, being variety, I guess. Um, but we're going to start simple uh, audio description. So I'm David Gray Hammond. I am a white, a white Mediterranean male in his mid thirties. Um, I have a shaved head, a beard, thick rimmed, purpley grayish glasses. I have a lip piercing and an ear tunnel. Um, I'm sat in a very blue room next to a famously rickety bookcase, and uh, I'm wearing a red checkered shirt. Um, Kelly, would you like to give an audio description? Yep, so I'm Kelly Booker. I'm 45 years old. I'm sat in my lounge at the moment, so there's just a beige wall behind me, sitting on a brown chair. I've got pink, pink chair, um, colourful glasses which are quite thick rimmed um i'm white and i'm welsh although i don't sound welsh thank you very much okay. okay so kelly um you run the facebook page behind the mask and uh yeah. your I, I think your your page is relatively new isn't it um yes i created it on the 16th of april this year okay so I guess uh, we'll do a bit of a getting to know you then for anyone who hasn't followed your page yet, which I highly recommend. Um, so when did you discover your neurodivergent identity? What was that journey like? That's a hard question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I started having thoughts about it in late October last year. Um, I started noticing patterns. I've known that my youngest child, I think, is autistic. She's awaiting an assessment. And I I have known that since she was around two years old, certain characteristics and behaviours. And, and also I've worked with disabled adults in um, an enabling support work capacity. So I've done courses on autism and, and, you know, things like that previously. So I know a little bit about it, but I, I guess I knew more of the stereotypical side of it um and it was only as my daughter started progressing and getting older and she was doing things that i recognized it was almost like looking in a mirror in some respects and um, some of the questions she would ask me you know how literal she was etc and she started doing and saying things that i remember doing and saying and, and so i started doing research um and looking into everything and yeah, by November, I had referred myself to the integrated autism service in my area. And I had also been to the GP to have a referral for an ADHD assessment. Um, so that was in November, um, I think. Well, actually, sorry, that, that was in November that I went to the GP about the ADHD and the autism and referral and then I didn't hear anything for ages so I actually then self-referred myself in January I believe to the autism integrated service and they were very good very quick responded I was very lucky responded within a few weeks and told me that they'd you know all discussed it and they were going to assess me I, so I'm now on a waiting list which is 27 minutes long and that was in February so I've got to wait but at least I know that's coming as for the ADHD assessment, um, there was a few errors initially. I had a letter saying that I had an appointment at the ADHD clinic. Then they um, wrote me another letter, cancelling it and postponing it for two months. Then the day before, I had to ring them because I had COVID to ask them if I could do a telephone assessment, um, to which they said that I could, not that somebody would ring me at 10 o'clock for my appointment the next day. Anyway, when the lady rang me, um, she explained that there'd been an error and that she was the medications person 
and um, that obviously as I wasn't assessed, I would need to have that done. So I said, oh, I did think it was, you know, rather fast that I'd got this appointment with you. And um, do you know how long it'll be? She said she wasn't sure. And then I waited another sort of two or three months to be receiving a letter from the locum psychiatrist to my doctor saying that um, I didn't meet the NICE guidelines for an ADHD assessment and that he believed that I was suffering with anxiety and issues around food, which I do. And I had put that, I'd, I'd written like a 14 page document for the ADHD referral and a 17 page document for the autism referral. So I was, I, I kind of knew that I had to be specific about what all my issues were. Otherwise I wasn't, you know, I was just going to get laughed out of the doctor's surgery. So um, I did, I, I did all of that. And um, sorry, I forgot what I was saying. That's absolutely fine. This is David's Divergent Discussions. We That's forget job, what we're saying it? all the time. So, so um, playing with my magnets here as well. So <laughs> I, um, so the ADHD referral. Um, oh yeah. So then I went back to the GP. Sorry, I went back to the GP and um, was very upset and obviously said that I didn't agree and that I thought that I did meet the NICE guidelines and I double checked them myself again. And the GP said that he he also thought that I did meet the guidelines and he wasn't quite sure why I hadn't been accepted. So he told me to write down my symptoms in more detail, which uh, adhere into the guidelines, which I did again, um, and sent those back. I then got a letter. Sorry, I sent them back to the GP and the GP said that he was going to ask them to outline why I didn't meet the criteria. Um, so I I was expecting a letter of reasons of why, and I didn't get that. I, I got a letter saying that, um, that they were going to assess me. I have a telephone mental health needs assessment test with me instead. So the nurse rang me and a few weeks ago, and we had that conversation. I said that I felt like I was kind of being fobbed off because I'd gone from sort of, you know, the psychiatrist looking at my case to being telephoned by a nurse to give me a a quick phone call um she assured me that that wasn't the case and that she was gonna after her lengthy chat with me she said she was going to go back to the psychiatrist rediscuss everything but that she'd spoken to him earlier that morning before speaking to me and he was adamant i didn't meet the guidelines so obviously i was quite upset about that um i've waited two weeks for her to discuss it with him and ring me back she did that today actually and she said that after speaking to one of her colleagues they had decided that they were going to put it to the I'm not sure if it's called a multidisciplinary team in 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 that uh, industry but so so rather than just take it back to that local psychiatrist himself she was going to put it to all of them to discuss in their next meeting so she's going to ring me again in two weeks to give me the decision that they've come to um but I have made it quite clear that I'm after doing more research I'm not 99.9% sure that I have autism and ADHD and you know I'm 45 years old now and I've struggled my entire life I cannot keep going on like this I need to not fix myself that's the wrong word but I need to find coping strategies techniques etc um, and, and I, I think there's a lot of stigma around they think that people just want to have an ADHD assessment now so that they can get medication for example i don't even like taking medication um, and i barely remember to take it so, so it's not about me just wanting to get some stimulants i don't like coffee i don't i don't drink caffeine i don't do any of that anyway um i i just want the opportunity to try the medication and see if it helps me and if it does wonderful fantabidozy and if it doesn't you know, I can tick the box off. At least it's been tried. Um, well, I, I think that's really important, isn't it? Because, you know, I, I think a lot of people find that they're sort of treated as if they're drug seeking when actually I know. They, they just want support. You know, yeah. um, you know I, I know for me, you know, being ADHD is very complicated because I can't necessarily take the standard ADHD meds because I have this history of psychosis and okay. a very well documented history of addiction and yeah. uh 
you know, that makes psychiatrists pretty reticent to uh, prescribe anything that might help with my ADHD. Yeah. But whilst we're on the topic of addiction, um, obviously we're here to talk about sobriety today. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I've, I'm sober seven years as of this year, which honestly feels like a bloody miracle because there was a time <laughs> when I couldn't have imagined being sober. You know, for Just anyone not familiar with my story, I, I entered into addiction when I was in my late teens. I was drinking heavily, um, smoking cannabis, and then I moved on to uh, uh, taking much stronger drugs and eventually ended up addicted to opioids like morphine and oxycodone. I was taking diazepam, which Americans may know as Valium. I was also okay. smoking a lesser known drug, although if you read the news at a certain yeah, you'd know it was called spice. They call it the zombie drug, um, and uh, I, I was a real mess. And it, it was, I, I. Everyone says, "Why did I get sober?" And like, th there's a lot of answers I could give. You know, well, I didn't want to die, and I wanted to live a full life, and I wanted to be there for my family. But truthfully, something just kind of changed in my head one day. It was like I woke up and went, "I can't go on like this," and. Yeah. That was when I made the decision to become sober. And for me to become sober, because I was using so many different things so heavily, I had to go into an inpatient ward in a psychiatric hospital. I had to go through a detox program on that inpatient ward. And uh, I came out of that inpatient ward off of most things, but still taking some things such as my Subutex prescription, which is kind of like an alternative to methadone. And, okay. uh, you know, eventually on April the 6th, no, sorry, April, uh, 2016, I had my first sober day. Um, it was not fun at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it uh, wasn't. Pretty quickly, I went straight into opioid withdrawal. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And uh, I spent a month trying to get over opioid withdrawal because when you've been on Subutex, it's not a quick... The, the withdrawal is slightly milder, I would say, than some opioids, but uh, okay. it is a very long withdrawal. <laughs> um, and, you know, even once you get through the sort of initial acute withdrawal symptoms, you go through something called post-acute withdrawal syndrome, okay. which can last for like a year or two years. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was actually 30 days into my withdrawal. I ended up back on the psych ward having a psychotic episode um that's probably a conversation for an entirely different podcast episode <laughs> but it was not a fun time in my life no. and i think people often forget this and i don't know if this is something you can speak to as someone i think you said recently on facebook you're about 15 weeks into sobriety i am 15 so, weeks on saturday just gone so i'll be pretty much four months this saturday I don't know perhaps what your experiences have been, but I think a lot of people try and make out like when you first become sober that suddenly everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows and you're going to be walking along the street like, yeah, everything's going to be great. Actually, you're, for me, like regardless, I found for a lot of people, regardless of the reasons that you get sober, especially when it comes to alcohol, it is so prevalent that sometimes it can feel like you're white knuckling all the way through it. Because for me, obviously I, I became sober because I was addicted and, you know, I don't know what, how you identify, you know, that would be up to you, not me. But for me, you know, as an addict, I was sent into a shop, alcohol. I went out with friends, alcohol, like I, everywhere I went, it was alcohol everywhere. The drugs were actually, Aside from the withdrawals, I didn't have to deal with too many cravings because it's not in your yeah, face. It's not in my face. But you know, even now at seven years sober, I go places and I'm like, why is there alcohol here? Like, like this is not a place I expected there to be alcohol. Because it's socially acceptable and because you've always got at the back of your head, I shouldn't drink. So you notice it more, I think. And that's that's the thing it's it's you know if my next door neighbor bought a blue transit van tomorrow then for the next six months all i would see when i walked down the road is blue transit vans oh is that my neighbor yeah when i gave up smoking i gave up smoking 13 years ago and 
I can completely agree with what you said. Every single where I looked was cigarettes. And even if it wasn't, it's the habit. It's it's the habits that you formed. I would wake up first thing in the morning and before I'd even done anything, I would have a cigarette. And there were certain times of the day where it would happen. So, you know, I'd put dinner in the oven, have a cigarette. I'd eat dinner, wash the dishes, have a cigarette. And it becomes that ingrained in, in your, like, like what you do. It, when you don't have that, like you said, people will say, oh, people say to me now, oh, you must be feeling amazing. Wow, you're doing really well. well like you've given up, you must be feeling great and like waking up really fresh without a hangover. And, and yes, in a sense, some days I do feel, obviously I'm not, I haven't physically got there is that, but like you in the early days, um, I did, didn't go through withdrawal as as um, badly as it seems you did, um, luckily for me and, and not so luckily for you, but I did, you know, have headaches, I felt nauseous, I went through some sort of withdrawal low-key but it was still withdrawal and then on top of that you've got the constant little thing in your head saying well when you feel crappy you normally have a drink have a drink yeah. have a drink just have one just have a drink tonight and then tomorrow you can go sober well well come on it's your friend's birthday she's having a party well i'll just have a drink tonight at her party and that's what i did for months before i gave up probably if i'm completely honest i think I began to notice that I had like a serious issue. I'm not quite sure if I'm an alcoholic or not, but it was around just before COVID, probably about a year before COVID, that I had a conversation in my head of you're drinking too much. Why are you drinking this much? You should be drinking once a week or once a fortnight. Why are you drinking four or five times a week? And it's not just a drink, like a 5% kind of cider. I, I drink 12%, 13% wine, you know. And it used to be one bottle of wine. And any more than that, I would be physically sick. I could not digest it. And, and what happened for me was um, grief. I lost my mum six years ago. So I, I guess my alcohol problem started then. But I didn't actually register it until about three years later when I realised that I'd got myself in such a rut and um the day she died I went out and bought two bottles of strong 12% wine and I drank both bottles within an hour and I wasn't even drunk but it helped me yeah. sleep and then the next day I bought two and the next day two and gradually over a few months two wasn't enough so then I went to three so I was drinking I wasn't drinking in the day or anything like that and I was still working and you know so I was functioning so people don't notice because if you function and you do the things you're meant to do, um, it, it, you know, nobody realizes you, you, there's no, there's nobody there to say, "Oh, come on, Kelly, you shouldn't be doing that. That's a bit too much." Because no, nobody knows. Because as soon as I come home and close the door, nobody knows what I get up to in the evening. You know, I could be yeah. doing anything, and I was just drinking so much. It was really, really bad. And after about three years, I sort of said to myself, come on now, you know, pull your socks up, snap out of it. Your mum's gone and you need to stop using alcohol because it's not going to change anything. It's making you fat. Initially, that was my issue. It was making me fat. That's what bothered me. I was getting fatter and fatter. Um, and I hated the way I looked, the way I felt. And so then I thought, right, I'm going to try and give up alcohol. And and I just couldn't. I, I actually right. couldn't. It started. I could go probably three days without a drink. Then I sort of stretched it at one point to about five days without a drink. Um, then COVID hit, and I worked through COVID because I was, was a support worker. So my little girl was still going to school with about eight other children in the whole school, and um, so that was tough because I'm a single mum so I was at home on my own so I was going to work I felt bad because I was putting her in school and putting her at risk um my daughter's mixed race and there was this big thing at the time about mixed race people being more affected by COVID um so you know I had all of this in my head as well as obviously trying to work and make sure that I didn't take any 
firms into where I was working. I was so worried I was going to make the people that I cared about because I, I, um, I've i got a big heart and I, I get very attached to people. And, you know, I was so worried that I would make someone ill. Um, so I come home and have a drink. Come home and have a drink to get rid of the stress. And obviously it was a lonely time because nobody's allowed to go anywhere or do anything. So it was literally get up, go to work, come home, drink. And it was like that a lot and I put a lot more weight on um and, and then yeah but I think I think the final straw for me of giving up was the last few months of my life I haven't been able to do the things that I loved which was walking and silly things like tying my shoes <laughs> you know things we all take for granted um showering myself dressing myself really really struggling to put a pair of socks on and thinking to myself what have I done to myself why have I done this to myself why would anyone do this to themselves um you know it, it's better this belief that I that anyone would do that to themselves on purpose yeah. um and so but I still couldn't stop it didn't matter how big I was getting it didn't matter that I couldn't walk 50 yards without getting out of breath or that I couldn't put my socks on I still carried on drinking and I still carried on eating because I have issues with food as well as as well as alcohol um you know I still carried on doing it and the reason why I carried on doing it is because it was the only thing that gave me any short-term relief from how miserable I was um and then a few months ago I went to the weight management team specialist weight management team I'd waited two years on the waiting list to see them because obviously I've known for a while I had a problem and I needed help but I had to wait two years and then when I went to see them they did a load of tests and um and then obviously I went in to see them they told me that I was now diabetic because I have other health issues as well um, and I've got PCOS so that's a precursor for um diabetes type 2 if you if you know if you don't watch your diet and everything um and obviously the age that I'm at now, everything was taking its toll on my body. So they told me that, that I, and I'm still waiting to see a liver specialist at the moment. So in, until I get that appointment, I don't actually know what damage I've done. I don't even know um, at this point if it's reversible or not. I'm hoping it is and that I've caught it in time, but, but I don't know. Um, so anyway, so I, I came home and then again, you wouldn't believe it. I found out that I was um, diabetic and had liver issues. And they said to me, you know, this is a big wake-up call for you now. You, you know, yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm going to do everything I can. Came straight out of the appointment, went straight to the shop, bought a load of alcohol, a load of junk food, came home and got wasted. Um, and did that for about a week because I just couldn't cope with the news I'd been given. And I didn't know what else to do because it was the only thing that made me feel better was having a drink and eating and um, I did that for about a week and it was actually another, it was two things really, it was another content creator that I'd seen on here, a very popular one um, from, am I allowed to say or? Yeah you're allowed to say. Yeah. So um, Claire Bowman she's okay. absolutely amazing and she's based in Canada but I resonate a lot with her story she's got picos she's got binge eating disorder um she was eating and, and drinking same as me because she was unhappy and i was seeing a lot of her videos coming up and she actually celebrated her first year sober um and i was sat here drunk watching these reels of claire thinking oh my goodness look at her look what she's gone from to Look how amazing she is, you know. And she was sat with this little cupcake on her birthday yeah. and one year sober, and she looked amazing and so happy. And I just thought, <sighs> and she, oh, the other thing is, what made her go sober was a quote she'd seen that said about, we all say we die for our kids. And I always say that, oh, I die for my kids. And many of us do. And she said she'd seen that quote. And then she saw another quote where somebody said, everybody says that. But would you live for your kids? Would you live for your kids? And that's what made her really think deeply about it. And again, with me, I, I, I sat here and I thought, thought, it's so true. I mean, I'm 45 years old. I've got a 27-year-old daughter, a 25-year-old son, an eight-year-old 
daughter and her soon to be nine year old grandson. And I'm 45 and my, I lost my mum at 57 to esophageal cancer, which is usually caused by, by drinking and eating bad foods. Um, you know, and I just and I just sat here and thought, what on earth am I playing at? What am I playing at? I don't want to be this person. I don't want to look like this. I don't want to feel like this. I want to be a better parent, better person, you know. But because I've got all of these other struggles in the background of being, I think, autistic and having ADHD, that has affected my life so massively from such an early age all the way throughout my life. The only coping mechanisms I had were comfort eating, which I started when I was 10. So I was 10 year old when I started binge eating and I was 10 year old when I first tried to commit suicide. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to trigger. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, but so that, you know, and I just think I've spent my entire life trying to hide it, trying to cope, trying to mask, trying to just pretend everything's okay. I've tried counselling. I did try, I have tried medication for anxiety um, once and that was during COVID and only because the doctor again had suggested it as they had many times before and I said that and this is why I'm saying I'm not just trying to get ADHD meds because I'm not pro meds any, anyway um, I only take them if I have to and you know she said she the, the doctor actually said to me look if you were diabetic you'd take insulin if you were told you needed it wouldn't you and I said yes and she said right so why won't you take meds for anxiety? Because it's the same thing. So I agreed to try it. I took them for about nine months, I think. Um, I didn't feel any better. It didn't help me any. It didn't stop me behaving erratically in the way I do behave. So, and it made me feel quite sick and nauseous most of the time and tired. So I thought, well, what am I doing? This is, you know, I've tried it. It doesn't work. So I weaned myself off slowly because I'm not a stupid person. I you know, I knew that if I just stopped them straight away, it would have a knock-on effect. So I um, weaned myself off. And as I say, I haven't been on anything else since. I've just been self-medicating, as you say, with alcohol and food. Um, yeah, and I think it's it's really important to talk about the fact that, you know, as neurodivergent people, <clears throat> and it, under the umbrella of neurodivergent people trying to enter sobriety, we often struggle with things like anxiety and depression. Or yep. so it seems a lot of the time it's actually related to burnout, mm -hmm. but doctors don't get burnout. So they just throw antidepressants at it and go, oh, why is that not working? Yep. You know what? Well, it's because it's burnout. It's it's not yep. depression it's or not, anxiety. Yep. This, or, this they, autistic person um, is burnt out. Yeah, they, that's what in that letter that the psychiatrist sent to my doctor recently, it said that um, they wanted the GP to treat me with pharma. The, they didn't use the word pharmaceutical, I think they used pharmacological or something, but they wanted me to be treated with that and with therapy for issues around food. And the other problem with that is I've tried getting um, therapy for issues with food in this area where I live, and there isn't any. The, it is know, a real postcode lottery in the UK. Yeah, not for binge eating and comfort eating. There isn't. Um, there is for anorexia and bulimia, but I don't fall under either of those. Um, I hate being sick. So you know um so yeah so it's just, it's just all very difficult isn't it and now at the moment i've got no alcohol i've got no food but you know not bad foods clutch foods if you like um and no medication and the professionals aren't listening to me <laughs> and the ones that are yeah. aren't able not their fault but they're not able to see me for two years and i just think well okay so what what am i and not just me but everybody what are we meant to do? It's all right for people to say, oh, be positive. Don't be anxious. Cheer up. <laughs> if I could tell myself that, don't you think I would already? Do you know? We do think I enjoy being miserable and moaning and drinking myself stupid. No, of course I don't. I hate it. But when you feel like you don't fit into society and you don't even fit in into your own family, how... Do you navigate that without help? How how do you cope? And I think that raises, you know, one of the big issues that I faced when I was entering into recovery was that, 
the support systems that exist were in no way designed for neurodivergent people. No. Like from from literal access perspective, they're not accessible. You know, you've got to remember appointments, phone calls. Yep. Uh, they want to prescribe medication, which you're probably going to forget to take. Yep. Um, you have different services bickering over who should take the lead. You know, I had mental health services saying, no, we can't help him till his, uh, you know, drug use is sorted. Yep. And the substance abuse services go, well, we can't help him. They with try that. and fob you up. You know, and you, you end up falling through the cracks. And in the end, you do a lot of the work on your own when you're neurodivergent. And mm -hmm. for me, that's why I started my blog was because I wanted people like they're not alone. And that's what I and think is exactly a real why credit I started to you. Mine. you exactly. You mm -hmm. I was gonna say it's a real credit to you because you know, sobriety is a really intimate and but also scary journey. Yeah. And you know, you're sharing it publicly with people, and I think that does people a lot of good. And actually I wanted to highlight this comment. Um from uh, Flynn Purple Bean, autistic artist, who says congratulations to us both for putting in the work and getting sober, and especially you, to you, Kelly, because you know you're you're 15 weeks into sobriety and you've agreed to come onto this podcast and talk about it. That's that's huge because it's it's a scary thing to talk about, and I think you said this is your first ever podcast as well. And I don't even listen or watch podcasts because I can't hold attention long enough, even if it's on a subject I enjoy. <laughs> so, yeah, this is, uh, and I'm not very good at technology either. So, it, it, yeah, this was scary for a number of reasons. One, I've got really bad anxiety. <laughs> Two, I'm no good at tech. Three, like you say, it's my first podcast. Um, and I suppose I am a bit nervous about you said about doing the public profile and I have and I've done that and I've been brave and you people say that but I mean am I brave or or am I just impulsive <laughs> you know I could just as easily delete that page as fast as I made it because that's the type of erratic behavior that I possess um and I'm joking about about it now and laughing but it really isn't funny when you live your life like that your life can change like that so suddenly and you're just left there in the aftermath thinking what have I done what have I said why did I do that or, you know it, so it, it, it really isn't funny um well you know, if it helps you're doing really well on this podcast and <laughs> I think you know it really helps stories because sobriety is not a well talked about subject in the in a lot of neurodivergent communities and I think it really helps to to have people, especially people who are perhaps earlier on in their journey into sobriety, coming forward and talking about it. Because I can talk about early sobriety as much as I like, um, but I'm seven years sober. I have a fundamentally different outlook now because for me, it's it's yeah. become a it's just become a way of life. Yeah. You know, I still wake up every day and make that boundary with myself that today I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to yeah. use, I'm not going to drink. But it's it's become quite a comfortable fit to do, yeah. do that. And it, and it does. Um, yeah. The same with smoking. Yeah. You know, every now and again, I'll walk past somebody who's having a cigarette or I'll be stood somewhere and someone will walk past and I'll, I'll just get that little whiff of a cigarette. And for an instant, and sometimes, not, not so much in the last few years, but before, you know, before, I would take a deep breath. So I'd walk past and I'd be like, oh, that smells so good. I'm not going to have one, but gosh, it smells good. Um, I don't tend to do that as much these days, so it does get easier, like you say. But, you know, just because you're seven years into it doesn't um, take away from the fact of th that you were newly sober. And, you know, yeah. and look how amazing you've done. And to be honest, you know, it sounds like you were on a lot of stuff a lot more stuff than myself and i think that that, that is really commendable yes Thank it's strong you. to give up alcohol but to give up alcohol and drugs and all at once and all of those all those different types i mean come on that, that is absolutely amazing there's not many people that come back from 
than that, is there? So no, and I am very proud of myself for, for, for you know getting sober. Mm-hmm. But I'm also very much the opinion that you know I don't compare my battle with another person's battle well, because no. you know the thing is is and I think I think a lot of people perhaps need to hear this sometimes is that just because your battle might look more simple than someone else's it doesn't mean it is because we're each our own individual we each have our own reactions and set of experiences and i know deal with things differently i i know people who didn't survive addiction who were only what only in inverted commas drinking for example you know i know people who perceptibly had a much easier time who didn't make it through um but this is the thing is for each of us it's 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 that very personal journey that we go on you know yeah. it's you know it's it's finding out what works for us you know i tried all sorts of things i tried 12 step programs i tried therapy mm-hmm. i tried willpower <laughs> you know in the end it it took me having that moment of going I just can't do this anymore. Which is what I kind of got to. It was like, what are you doing? Yeah. What are yeah. you doing? <laughs> Have but a word with the thing was, <laughs> one of the things that helped me the most was finding the online autistic community because yeah. suddenly there were other people who understood the things I was struggling with. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of autistic people can probably relate to this. Yeah. My autistic identity was so frowned upon by wider society that I traded it for one of being dependent on drugs and alcohol because I felt David the drug taker was more easily accepted than David the autistic guy. I believe that. That was one of the that was one of the most profound aspects of, of being addicted was that the person who I was naturally was was so frowned upon by society that I I would have rather stayed an addict and it, it was only because I found the autistic community and found people who could accept me for who I am you know my, my family have always been quite supportive of me but there's a whole world outside of our family yeah you know to even have that privilege see, like I did yeah I, said, yeah. I, I didn't even know until obviously very recently that I was part of that community and a lot of people have said to me now or people that know me are probably thinking um well why 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 now you're 45 you've got this far why do you need it you've done perfectly fine you know people say to me all the time you've done college you've got jobs you've been to work you know why do you need it but they have absolutely no idea what goes on in my head every single day from from being as young as I can remember until now and I can quite honestly say that if I didn't have my children I would not be here today I would be one of those people that were lost and that is the only thing that's kept me going and I didn't know why that that's the worst part if I'd have known 20 years ago that I was autistic and had ADHD I could have sought out and you know help sooner professionally but also um like like you said through the community and just to find people these last few weeks since i've been on facebook and obviously i found the community kind of before that so i wasn't really interacting but i was all of the awareness online had all of the awareness that's been happening in recent months the last year or so if that hadn't have happened i still wouldn't know probably i'd still be walking around feeling like I don't want to be alive and still drinking every day and feeling desperate and complete despair and not knowing why why don't people like me why don't why why do people get annoyed at me why did that person get cross when I just asked them a question because to me it feels like it's a normal perfectly reasonable question and yet to them they think I'm being argumentative or annoying or and it It's just, like you just said, it's just so horrible for people to not understand you. And then that's what made me make the blog, because um, since I've made the blog, people interacting and saying things to me, and I've had a few messages and things, of people that just understand me, and also just seeing the way people speak to other people. 
in the neurodivergent community. I actually finally feel like I'm not horrible, useless, you know, annoying, emotional failure of a person, which, which is how I've always felt. Now I feel like, oh, okay. So I, because I suffer really bad with ADHD rage and I didn't even know what that was until recently. And I've suffered with that my whole life. And that has ruined most of my relationships, if not all of them. My outbursts, my emotional outbursts, my anger. The, my, I've lost most of my family, the ones that I was close to because of it, because they couldn't put up with me anymore. And in a way I can understand because they don't didn't understand. But like you said, now, those same people, not necessarily my family, but people that know me or are close to me or have been close to me will be thinking and saying, well, what difference will it make? What, what, what's the point? Why does she need it? And that's why I need it. I need it because I need to forgive myself for all of the times where, you know, I thought that it was me and that I was being purposefully because people People, it's like people almost think you do it on purpose and you just, why are you like that? Why would you even say that? You know, and you're like, well, and you just don't understand what you've done wrong. Yeah. And I can only recognise that now, seeing my daughter, because my daughter says things and I even think, oh, I can't believe she just said that. And then I'm like, well, actually, that's exactly the type of thing that I say and think. And so I understand um, and I'm much kinder. Because of because I understand, I'm much kinder to her and with her. Um, yeah, I forgot what the what I was going on about then. I've gone off on a tangent again. Sorry, but it's okay. It's okay. But, yeah, but I think hard, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And one of the things that I really want people to take away from this conversation and a lot of the conversations I have is, first of all, you're never too old or too young to fall into some kind of dependency or addiction. Yeah. You're never too old or too young to seek recovery and, you know, seek sobriety. But the most important thing people need to understand is to addiction. It knows no boundaries. It doesn't care what, what your race is, what, what your gender is. It doesn't care what your... Uh, How much money it you have. What, it, doesn't, it, literally, it doesn't matter what identity you are you can become addicted it, you know you've just got to have the right you know dominoes fall and especially and i think a lot of professionals need to hear this it can especially affect neurodivergent people you know there, there's research at the university of cambridge that suggests that autistic adolescents and adults are more likely to report self-medicating their struggles with recreational drugs and yet services they don't even standardly screen for autism and ADHD. That, that should be the first thing they do because yeah. I think they'll find that a lot of the people coming through the doors of their services are neurodivergent. I and totally agree. It's, it's, it almost and seems like... they won't even know they are. No, Those exactly. Those people won't even know that they're neurodivergent. And they'll it's, just it's, know it's, that they're very unhappy and they won't understand why they don't feel good. Precisely. And when you've got neurodivergent people who don't know they're neurodivergent, they don't know why the world is so cruel to them, they, you know, it, it becomes almost an inevitability that, that something like addiction could happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very reasonable to suggest that actually just introducing them to other neurodivergent people could make a world of difference when yeah. it comes to finding sobriety. And yet people still don't even know that communities like ours exist you know and people who need to know that we're out there don't know we're out there um, well, i didn't and it's only know? been as i say th these last few weeks i wrote um a comment in one of the groups because obviously not everything is public on facebook and there's a few um sort of neurodivergent private groups that i've been invited to and stuff which is really nice and it's just really i feel really welcomed and, and it's lovely and i wrote a comment in there about how you know over these last few weeks I have literally felt m more like I fit in and more pleasure to be around people I know it's online not physically but I feel more um at ease now than I have my entire life anywhere else and 
you know, like people say, oh, and they, they see these reels or memes on Facebook and everybody likes them and they have a laugh and they say, oh, every, like, you know, everyone's a bit autistic and I do that and I do this. And, you know, just because you do that doesn't mean you are. Or just because you do that doesn't mean you are AD, have ADHD because I do that and I, I don't. And, and you just think, well, actually, maybe you do, first of all. Maybe you actually do and you just haven't looked into it enough. Um, and secondly, those memes, um, they really help because just to have that comment, there might be 380 comments, you know, and most of them will be saying, I'm exactly the same. I have exactly the same thoughts, the same feelings. I've been through that. I can relate. And just seeing those words makes me feel, I can't even explain, it makes me feel that I'm normal. It's that feeling, of, com- that feeling of community connectedness. Yeah. I'm like, oh. So, you know, because I've hit a, a lot of my, especially like the ADHD rage, I, I, I say I've hit it. You know, I, I haven't hid it from people close to me, hence why I've lost most people close to me. But, you know, I can keep certain distances, and I do, from from people um, because of it. But I try to mask it, and then I'll, I'll come home and have a meltdown because I've been together all day at work, and, and like most of us do, you know. And then the same as children, when the teachers say, well, there's nothing wrong with the child because she behaves all day at school, and then and the child goes home and has a complete meltdown because they feel safe at home and they can unmask. And I just think, um, I forgot what I was saying again. That's okay. That's okay. Well, oh my goodness, I, me. I was, I, I wanted to wrap this up with uh, some really good, you know, some, some positivity. So, you know, I was thinking like for me now at seven years sober, yep. what, the, the thing I love most about sobriety other than the fact that I now have my son and, you know, lo- you know, friends and family supporting me a lot and, you know, but the thing personally that I love most about being sober is that if I want to do something, I don't have to filter it through, but how will I do that around being drunk or high? And I, I love that freedom because being, you know, be- drinking or using drugs, everything is filtered through. How can I do that and still get my fix? Yeah. And I don't have that weighing me down anymore. So, you know, if I want to write a book, I've, I've written books. You know, if I want to start a blog, I started a blog. You know, if I want to connect with people, I can connect with people without the fear that I'm going to get drunk or high and say something stupid that will ruin it. Yeah. And I love that about being sober. And I was wondering for you, being you just... newer to sobriety than me, what 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 are the little things that, that you're enjoying about sobriety? You just um up then um i suffer really bad with rejection sensitive dysphoria and having that that coupled with adhd and adhd rage is not a good combination and then throw alcohol into the mix that's not gonna end well and it never does end well and i have said so many things to so many people in temper whilst feeling rejected, being upset, and whilst drunk. I mean, I still suffer without drinking with it, but I can be a little bit, um, I'm a little bit more careful. It, well, a lot more careful. <laughs> so, you know, I'll think, oh, and then I'll think, right, no, you can't say that. If I was drunk, I'd say it. And I've lost a lot of people, like mostly, I suppose, romantic relationships, because things have been too much I've been too stressed I've been overworked or overstimulated and then I've had an outburst and, and you know we haven't been together that long and they probably think oh my goodness she's a crazy person I don't want to be anywhere near her and so they disappear and it's a pattern that's happened throughout my life so I'm hoping that now that I know that I'm neurodivergent now that I am sober um that the positive that I can take away from this is that I can start tearing back the layers and, you know, writing down all of my triggers. First of all, I want to know what are all my triggers? How can I avoid them? How can I put things in place that are healthy? Replace all of the old bad coping techniques that I had that clearly weren't working for me, <laughs> although they appeared to be in some ways. 
um, you know, how can I turn my life around now, whether that's with or without professional support, because it doesn't look like I'm going to get that anytime soon, even if I do get it. But and they, they haven't got a magic wand either. They can't fix everything. You know, there's a lot of work that I've got to do um, and a lot of research. And I'm hoping that I can. I mean, I, I've kind of become very sedentary. Um, and I kind of keep myself to myself and stay away from people mostly because I'm so scared of losing people. And I know if I get close to them, I will, because they'll see the true me. So what I'm now trying to do is show them the true me from the start instead of pretending to be somebody that I think they want to know. And then, you know, if they're going to disappear, they're going to disappear early doors and find ways of doing things differently so that I'm not presenting as so erratic and irrational so that people maybe do want to be around me. I don't know. It's all, it's and, all a uh, jumble in my head. Moat's page, Moat's place, the page uh, has chimed in to agree with you. You know, learning, understanding your needs is a great starting point. And I will actually say, obviously, you know, professionally, I do a lot of mentoring and uh, I, I've worked with other autistic people seeking sobriety and, the first thing I do is to, you know, help them understand their autistic self so that they know what their needs are, what their struggles are, what their triggers are, so they can set boundaries in their life which are going to be protected. Because I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, we don't have the boundaries we should do because we've been taught that our boundaries don't matter. I have and they do. Boundaries. It doesn't matter who you are, that. you know, our boundaries matter, you know, and, and it's important to have them. But mm -hmm. it's been really great having you on, Kelly. Um, it, it's, it's been a really good episode. And I know you were nervous because it was your first ever podcast, but you have done fantastic. I feel less nervous now it's over. So, so can we do it again? <laughs> yeah, we can definitely do another episode <laughs> at some point. But um, it's been really good having you on, Kelly. Um, Thank you. As I said earlier in the podcast, if you haven't checked out Kelly's um facebook page yet it's called behind the mask um please do go check it out and uh thanks to everyone who came and listened um this has been david's divergent discussions and i'll catch you all in the next episode now's the point where we all wave awkwardly whilst we wait for the stream to end oh we're not gonna hug <laughs> <laughs>